Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Cassidy Diamond. I am the Associate Director of Public Programs and Events here at the IDA. Uh, thank you for joining us for this conversation around PBS's The Neutral Ground, moderated by NPR's Eric Deggins. And before we get started, I would like to offer a brief land acknowledgement. I'm coming to you today from Chicago, which is on the unceded land of the Potawatomi people who have been stewards of this land for generations. I'd also like to give a shout out to our media sponsor, IndieWire, for uh, helping us bring this series to you all. And without any further ado, I'm gonna hand things over to Eric to get things started. Hello and welcome to the International Documentary Association's panel on the neutral ground. I'm Eric Deggins, a TV critic for NPR and moderator for this event. And I am happy to welcome the film's narrator, co-writer, director, I don't know, bottle washer, CJ Hunt, uh, producer Darcy McKinnon, and producer, uh, well, executive producer, of course, Roy Wood Jr. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us, guys. Hey. Uh, really thanks, great Eric. film. Yeah, so, so glad to have you. So, so my first question is pretty simple. Um, how did a couple of knuckleheaded comics wind up creating this documentary about, about uh, getting rid of these Confederate monuments in New Orleans? Yeah, I mean, it, it was a hard, it's a hard pitch to tell people in 2015 and 16, it's a comedy about the Confederacy. <laughs> um, but in 2015 and 2016, I hadn't met Roy yet. I was just a wannabe comic. I was living in... Um, New Orleans and I'd been teaching for a while and then really trying to focus on, okay, how do I, how do I write for TV? How do I make comedy like the things that I like to see on TV? Um, and I had known Darcy, uh, my producer from, you know, she was a mentor teacher to me when we were, when, you know, when I was new to the city and was a teacher and we saw the sort of pushback and backlash and insane things that people were saying about, oh, well, this is all of our history and Robert E. Lee freed his slaves and actually the first slave owners were black. Like all of the nonsense that was being said, I was like, this is comedy. And I talked to Darcy and I was like, hey, you got, you got access to cameras. Can we go film this meeting? So Darcy, what did you think when he came to you with this idea? Well, I'm not a comic and I'm only marginally a knucklehead. Um, so it took uh, me a minute to- so You were completely unprepared for this. <laughs> <laughs> we had, a, we'd started out and I mean, part of it was my backgrounds in documentary and I was a seventh grade history teacher. So in conversations with CJ about it, I was particularly um, uh, angry at the misuse of the word history with a capital H uh, in defense of arguments that were indefensible. And so um, I loved CJ and I, I, I loved his work and I knew him well enough to know he's going to make something great, even though I wasn't sure how we were going to navigate um, the humor. And I think our the creative tension between us throughout the whole project has been uh, CJ is always working on how to make things funny. And there's times when I'm asking him to pull back on that and let the story uh, take the lead or the footage take the lead. And that's kind of how we've built a film that's both a documentary and a comedy, I think. That's really interesting because I was gonna ask about the tone of it because I can feel it when I, when I, when I watch it that there are moments when you kind of lean into the comedy and there are moments when you don't. How, how did you sort of know, and, and if you have a great example of maybe uh, a scene or a moment that you guys uh, sort of had that debate about and how it turned out, that'd be great to hear. I mean, when I first started this, I didn't really have aspirations of being a filmmaker. You know, all of my references were comedy. So part of what you're seeing over the course of the film is me figure out what verite film is even supposed to be. Um, and at the same time, it, there's sort of a conflict that's happening because as soon as we start making the film, I get hired for my first job in late night. So, you know, and I, I go to the rundown with Robin Thede on BET, and then I go to Daily Show and meet Roy. So like my whole day job every day is the structure of field pieces and how do you, how do you make this fast and sharp and funny and short? 
Um, and I think Darcy was, was really good at being like, hey, we don't need jokes here. Like this can breathe. Verite is able to still be funny, but without adding VO on top. Um, that's that's how the Daily Show <laughs> trains us, though, man. Where's the joke? Need yeah. another joke? More jokes? Yeah. How, how many seconds has it been since we had a joke? <laughs> which was which was a perfect counterbalance too, because then when Roy was able to come on as EP, it was like his first comments were like, "Bro, we need jokes in here. We need these at the top to be able to earn where we end up going." And I think that that's. I think that that's right. When you look at the structure of the film, all so many of the jokes are crammed up top to be like, it's going to be okay. We're going to be okay. This is fast. This is absurd. So that by the time, you know, I think the term Roy was using was like earning what happens in, in Charlottesville in this film. Mm -hmm. By the time the film gets to its darkest point, the audience is, is rooted in place. And I think the comedy was important for that. Cool. So, so Roy, I'm sure you run into a lot of aspiring comics who have films that they're working on. What made this stand out and what got you involved? For me, it was the issue at hand. So I already, you know, I, I'm not, I don't purport myself to be some sort of wokey woke in the sense of I'm gonna change everything. But the stuff that I gravitate towards is stuff that speaks to specific issues. We had, uh, the sitcom at the time about probation, which was essentially about recidivism. And then we were working on a million other things with The Daily Show, even the stuff I'm working on now, it all speaks to problems. And so when CJ brought this to me, at this point, it's it's pretty, it's pretty well down the road and what he'd been producing. The biggest arguments in the argument that I had with CJ, which was kind of different from Darcy's was, hey man, this stuff is still happening. Let's keep adding more. And he's like, Roy, we're done dude, 2020 just happened, we gotta keep going. And that was where it really started speaking to me on a larger level was that, okay, yeah, this started with New Orleans, but what was happening in New Orleans was a narrative for something that was happening nationally. Now, of course, when he started shooting, he didn't know Charlottesville, then Trump, and then George Floyd. And, you know, I remember being at home in Birmingham um, during the shutdown in 2020, and a bunch of people in Birmingham tied a rope to a Confederate monument, tied the other end of that rope to a pickup truck and attempted to pull down. They almost like killed people. Try It was comically hilarious. And I called CJ and I'm like, hey, we need to add the pickup truck. And he's like, dude, we're in edit. What are you talking about? people got to know the truth, CJ. So I just became obsessed with everything else that was going on. But, you know, CJ was a, um, was a um, segment director and field producer for The Daily Show. So you already know his passion for it. And I know he's funny. So, you know, for me, it was a no brainer. Also, as a producer, I don't have to go everywhere he's going. When he's doing this documentary which was the most exciting part of it was not having to travel all the time that's gonna that's, be roy's quote on it. this film roy's quote is gonna be i did not have to dress up in civil war garb roy would you <laughs> that's the uh that's the executive in executive <laughs> yes ladies and gentlemen yes so so cj i know that you have probably heard this before but man i love your father he is so <laughs> good in this film and he just brings it. I mean, from the moment when he's like challenging your story about when you decided to be black to the story about him coming to your your Lily White prep school on MLK Day and telling them they have pieces of a lynched black man in their attic, probably. <laughs> I was just like, I love this brother. So tell me a little bit about the decision to to include him uh, in in the in the film. Yeah, I mean, he's he's saying you have pieces of a lynch body in your attic rhetorically and maybe actually. Yeah. And that was, that was, I was so embarrassed at the time when that story happened, but so much of the film and so much of, of what we are seeing now is like, that is the question, right? Like the question is, what is in the attic of the country and, and do we actually have what it takes to face it? Unfortunately, when I started, I thought the question was, would you be okay with the PGT Beauregard statue if it was just the horse? What if we took the guy off and it's just the horse? It's like all of these, these little iPad jokes. And I think Darcy was, 
so key for me in being like, bro, you cannot be making iPad jokes for 82 minutes. That is not what a documentary is. And, and at a certain point, it became clear that like, we have to get deeper about why we're telling the story. And that's, you know, that's definitely where dad came in. Well, you know, uh, what's interesting to me too, is this idea of um, progress and backlash. Like, I, I think a lot of people still don't get that what's happening in America and our history is filled with it is progress for marginalized people and then white supremacy that rises in backlash. So we have reconstruction and then we have the redemption. We have civil rights acts in mid 60s. We have the Southern strategy. We have Barack Obama. We have Donald Trump. We have uh, progress in the wake of the death of George Floyd. And now we have Cal, the Cal Rittenhouse verdict. And, and I'm wondering, are, do you feel like we're kind of in the middle of something like that right now? I mean, are we, are we on the cusp of a, a backlash after having seen this whole summer of attention to systemic racism uh, in the wake of the murder of uh, George Floyd? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Wow, yes, that's yes, a long yes, way to go to get some more. I could go on, but yes. I mean, I think this- Please go on. <laughs> we've, got, we've got 40 minutes to fill, Darcy. Come oh, on, you're a producer now. <laughs> yes. Um, the answer is yes. The answer is absolutely yes. I mean, I think Cal Rittenhouse is a great example of what's happening in terms of how we are collectively addressing the, the harms that are done uh, to Black people by white supremacy and allies in the case of Cal Rittenhouse. Um, and I think one of the issues that came up in the neutral ground that we're continuing to follow up in our next creative project is how the work of um, particularly the United Daughters of the Confederacy and other people post reconstruction to change the way that education and that children of successive generations understood a false history of the lost cause is happening right now. At, we, I think we're at 10 states um, across the country and they go and they include Wisconsin. They are not all Southern states that have passed laws to, to ban critical race theory. Critical race theory as a concept has doesn't have anything to do really with K-12 education, but it's been weaponized by uh, particular forces out of the right and has been passed into law in state legislatures across the country. And I think you can see it as a direct uh, response to the upswell as specifically around monuments and, um, and the way that it was a conversation between local governments, state governments and the federal government. And this is another way it's to the side, it's coming in this way. Um, but what it's going to result in is a change in how textbooks are adopted at the state level, which is gonna change how children in classrooms are able to read about history. And it is putting teachers, CJ and I are both former teachers, at risk of their jobs for teaching concepts that I think collectively, if we understood the words that are being outlawed, we, we would not be afraid of terms like equity and oppression being taught in the history of the United States of America. Um, that is happening right now and it's continuing to move forward. And it is a kind of like boring and banal legislative change that is happening that is going to have ripple effects into the future after the big show we got the monuments down and and they've been pulled down um small legislative changes are going to happen in the background that will lock down possibilities for the future and i think and when we think about race we're thinking about kyle rittenhouse right we're thinking about the lee removal but the idea that over 10 states, I think it might be up to 12 now, like we are touring this film around in as many schools as possible, partly because we see governors like making that literally illegal. And we've taught this film in schools where if somebody reports that the film was there, they have a CRT ban on the books, those teachers can be fired and the school can be fined up to $5 million, right? So like that is the reshaping right? That, that when we think about the, the structure of backlashes and reconstruction, it is not only the Klan, right? And lynchings. It is the reshaping of that entire, uh, of, of the entire way that our, our laws look, right? Like we had, we had integrated schools in 1874 and we lost it and we had to wait a whole century. So I think that's the thing I think about when it's backlash, like 
what are the things that we're talking about on Twitter that are very in front of our face and like, oh God, race. But then what are these really like brooding monsters that we can't fully get our mind around that are also reshaping our world? And what's wild is that that's just the long game. We haven't even gotten into all of the gerrymandering that was successfully done in numerous states that voted one way in 2020 that I guarantee you is going to be an even tighter fight in 22 while fighting misinformation to even get people to the polls to try and change some of this stuff. I won't bore you with gerrymandering statistics. Just know that what happened in Georgia in 2020, you're going to need the equivalent of four Hail Marys to get over what they've done this time. But they're all the same thing. They're all do not talk about the past, right? Like mm -hmm. how, how, how was Voting Rights Act gutted in Shelby v. Holder? It was, let's not, let's not be able to, to talk about race in gerrymandering, right? They took that away from us and that's how they broke that law, right? What is the monuments issue? It's let's not talk about Lee having slaves. Let's not talk about what the Confederacy wrote down. What's the CRT issue? Oh, let's not talk about our past. Let's not teach kids that this is a fundamentally, yeah. fundamentally racist country. And so all of those things, they feel like different things, but they're all the same thing, which is look away, look away. Do not look at the past. What you're gonna, you're gonna outlaw teaching the truth, well, I'm going to vote in someone who will, let, oh, dang, I can't do that either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. I was, I, was all, I was all ready for that, that civil rights moment, that, that Selma moment. And, no. and yeah, yeah. Well, well, yeah. That's going to be all our future civil rights movies. It's going to be like, if I can't win there, I'll win. Wait, never mind. <laughs> Hey, as somebody who lives in Florida and raised four kids here, let me tell you, uh, I, I completely sympathize. One of the biggest fights I ever got into was when I found out that um, my youngest social studies class was reading Bill O'Reilly's history, one of his history books in class. And I was like, uh, no, no, yes. we're going we to have a discussion about what history really is. Yes. Yeah. But, but even, even that sentence, right? Like where we are is so absurd. And I think that's like, why I go to comedy, it's almost a survival mechanism that when, when we were saying take down Robert E. Lee, right? The other side was saying, no, 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 let's not take down statues. Let's have a measured conversation about the past. And now we're like, let's have a measured conversation about the past. And they're like, that's illegal, right? Like, <laughs> like the, the way the window keeps moving it, it is, hey, is what ahead. boggles the mind and also what makes us go to comedy or else we're gonna go, we're gonna lose our minds. Right. Well, you know, it's interesting, like parts of this film kind of feel like a Trojan horse in a way, because there are times when you sort of look like you might be saying, well, maybe these people have a point, like the point that you made about uh, memorializing all of the Confederate soldiers uh, who weren't who were just dumped in mass mass graves. And although I thought to myself, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of Nazis who were dumped in mass graves, too. You don't see any monuments to them in Germany. <laughs> but uh, uh, but so I talk a little bit about trying to, you know, develop a tone where you at least um, try to talk to the other side or try to talk to people who are, um, you know, on, an, on a have a different understanding of this and get their point of view in the film uh, in a way that seemed like it was pretty, pretty fair to their point of view. Yeah, I mean, I think that is, um, I think when, when one talks to a white supremacist, the question is, are you putting them on, a, are you giving them a platform? Right. And for us, it was like, how do we make whatever they are standing on, not a platform, but like an examining table, right? That we are not the news. We are not, you know, if, if you took a sample of news from 2015 to 2017, half of every story on Confederate monuments is them being like, this was an enslaver, people wanna take it down. Now let's spend three minutes with a man in a tweed coat pointing at a statue going, that was my ancestor. And these people say all the things. They say every, every major civilization had slaves. Slavery wasn't that bad. And the, the America doesn't have literacy around those speaking points to understand that that's our version of Holocaust denialism. Right, you would never put a person on the news who was like, well, I don't know how many Jews actually died, right? Like we would recognize that that's Holocaust denialism. But part of the reason we made this movie is that when people, when, when news organizations are putting those men in tweed coats and with their flags, whether they call them preservationists or, or neo-Confederates, 
that news agency thinks they're being neutral, but they're giving a platform for actual propaganda. So for us, we're including those folks, not because we think that we need to be even handed and we really need to hear their side, but it was important for us to show what the lie is made of, how consistent the lie is, where it comes from and what its parts look like. So reviews sometimes get it wrong where they're, when I read a review that's like, CJ strikes a, a shockingly neutral tone. I'm like, oh no, y'all didn't watch the movie. <laughs> but for us, it's like every minute we spend on the other side is to show you how fragile that argument is and to show you that we didn't pull any tricks in showing what that argument is. Mm. And you even have what, you have like a bell that kind of goes off or something? Ding! Yeah, yeah. So you even, there's even like this Pavlovian, hey, this is bullshit. Can, can we say that? <laughs> bullshit. It's bullshit, pal. Yeah. Keeping track of it all. Yes. We want that ding going off in people's heads after. When you see John Kelly be like on the news, you know, Robert E. Lee was an honorable man, your head should be going ding. And we just, we hope the audience is, the comedy is not just to like hold your hand, it's to also make sure that the movie stays with you after you leave the theater. Yeah, that makes sense. So um, in the film, you explain what the neutral ground is and the fact that, um, you know, there are Confederate monuments located there uh, in New Orleans. But can you talk a little bit about why you chose that name for the film uh, and, and, and ultimately what you think that symbolizes? Talk about it. I think, you know, if you've been in New Orleans, the neutral ground is it's more than just a median. And the fact that we've named it the neutral ground as a, as a community has made it more than that. It's a place where people play horseshoes. It's a place where you park your car when there's a hurricane. It is a place where people come together. You can say, are you on the neutral ground side when you're directing someone how to find you at a Mardi Gras parade? It is very much a way in which we orient ourselves as a community in the city of New Orleans. And I think for that reason, it was really, it is really kind of, it's also one of those things that's real specific to this place. And so for me, um, I've lived in New Orleans for 20 years and I was real concerned that we, and I'm, I'm from Florida originally too. And I was really concerned- I'm sorry. About <laughs> um, I apologize for that. You know what? I'm, I'm nearby, I can watch it from a distance these days. Um, and I think it was important to me that we made a film that didn't say, that was specific to New Orleans and, and brought what was specific about New Orleans to the, to the larger narrative. And New Orleans has a unique place in the history of the Civil War. We had the first Lee Monument, but Lee never came here. And in many ways, we were the, one of the shortest uh, the shortest time periods that the Confederacy held a city. So that the power of the myth is really strong. There's no reason we should be a bastion of Confederate history and that it, it was that it should have been a place that people came to to somehow protect the myth. We were not Richmond and not Charlottesville in terms of our role in the Civil War. Um, in terms of our role in the slave trade as a city, in fact, were. So I think it was kind of imbuing the the, the film with its New Orleans-ness. Our crew is all from New Orleans. This was a film we made here. Um, and in part for me, it's because my responsibility as a Southerner is to address these issues as well. This is not for, uh, you know, folks in New York or California to come down and tell these stories, we have to be accountable to our own stories, to our own ugly histories and to our own solutions. So I think for me, naming the film The Neutral Ground was also kind of tagging it to this place. And it also captures the absurdity that the thing that is supposed to be for all of us, the thing that is supposed to, to be the community is literally occupied by monuments to enslavers and a white militia who shot cops in the streets. Right. And, and so for us, that image of a little narrow strip where we're supposed to gather, but we can't gather because it's in the shadows of, of the of of literally the most racist monuments. They wrote white supremacy on these monuments to us that captured the whole idea of this is not neutral. This has never been neutral. And it also captures the fact that so many of these other parks nationally are also a place, though constructually not the same in, in the terms of what the neutral ground is in New Orleans. This is a park, man. I'm supposed to be able to just sit here and chill and throw a ball. I, I shouldn't have to look up at enslavers the entire time. And so like it felt like the, the other thing that really that I really enjoyed about what, you know, about what CJ had kind of started putting together was how much the film also talks about the role that the North played 
in all of this as well. And I thought that that was something that, you know, that for me growing up in the South, you you learn, but you don't learn all of the intricacies. And so it was really, it was really dope to see CJ really get in the weeds and all of that. Yeah, yeah. Well, the redemption wouldn't have been possible if the North hadn't gone along with it, so. The, the KKK was reborn because of Birth of a Nation. Where do we think Birth of a Nation was shot? We think Birth of a Nation was shot all over the South. Birth of a Nation is being shot on a back lot in LA. So th the idea that, that, you know, I think we think, most audiences think, ah, these backward Southerners, they put these monuments up in the middle of the night. Yeah. Angela Kinlaw, an organizer would take him down, Nola in the movie is like, they didn't put these things up at night. They put these up in broad daylight. And they put these up with their speeches, shouting out all the Northerners in the crowd. Every speech has a section where they're like, where are all my people from the North at? Thank you so much for the money for this thing. <laughs> um, so these were, these were makeup gifts. Like, you know, when you're in a relationship and you do your partner wrong and you, and you get them a makeup gift, these were makeup <laughs> gifts between the North and the South being like, I'm sorry, baby. Let's, let's make a new road from here on out. It's white supremacy, baby. Those black people, they don't mean anything to me. They don't mean anything to me. I'm not even going to look at them. I you don't heard I gave them the vote? I don't I even know vote. abolition. I don't even know abolition. <laughs> yeah. Who is abolition? I deleted that from my phone, baby. <laughs> I let him vote once upon a time, but now. Mm -mm, mm -mm. It meant nothing to me. It meant nothing to me. We were separated. I let him vote a little bit. <laughs> so so what's interesting to me um, about New Orleans is that it's one of our oldest melting pots, right? Um, you know, racially, especially. And and I wonder, is the tension and the and and the tenor of discussion about race in New Orleans, is there something special about what happens there? Because that that conversation's been going on for so long. Um, there's so many people there who know the history. Is it is it different in that city than it would be here in Florida or elsewhere? I would say so. Um, I think it's important to know if it wasn't made clear in the film that in the scenes you're seeing where there are white supremacists and League of the South and and uh, Oath Keepers, etc., defending the Robert E. Lee and Jefferson Davis Monument, those were not citizens of Orleans Parish and the city of New Orleans. Those are people who are coming from without and staking a claim. And what's what one of the things that always struck me is it is the opposite of small government, right? The city of New Orleans should have the right to determine how to execute its use of municipal space on its own. And yet there were hundreds and hundreds of people who came from Alaska, California, Arkansas, Mississippi to defend an idea of the South in a place in which they didn't live. I never felt unsafe during all of those uh, protests because I was in the city of New Orleans and the New Orleans Police Department treated it like it was, you know, a spicy Mardi Gras parade. They had everybody pretty well separated and pretty and they kept us safe. Um, and I think the conversations that we're having in New Orleans today is how far to go. Um, school renaming conversations, um, street renaming conversations. I will say there are still, as in any city and any city in the South or anywhere, recalcitrant forces. So while Jefferson Davis Boulevard has been changed to Norman C. Francis Boulevard, Robert E. Lee, which is in a predominantly white neighborhood, is still the name of Robert E. Lee. And Lusher Charter School, which is a predominantly white affluent school, is still struggling to figure out how to effectively change its name after a segregationist. And, uh, and, and so we, we are still, you know, we've still got Tulane, we've still got Calhoun, we've still got plenty uh, that we have to do, but I do think the conversation is moving forward more quickly here. Um, and that is not necessarily true in Florida or even in the rest of the state of Louisiana, but we're, we're kind of dragging the conversation over. That is hopefully what I think, I hope New Orleans will do is that places around here have to drag even closer to the long arc of history if we continue doing our work in the city. I would say it's also, it's also, we tried to show that the people, you know, there are sections in the film, you know, where people are, are sh holding up signs like, bro, you lost twice, you know, to these neo-Confederates, <laughs> or you see a group of protesters singing, get the F out of New Orleans. Like it was important for us to show 
that most of the city is like, what are you guys even doing here? Get out of here. You're a skinhead who came from Oakland. What, what is this? <laughs> um, but I, I do think that there is because of when you think of the French Quarter and we have a line in the film being like, Freddie and Luther understand it's difficult to show people what the French Quarter used to sell mm. in, in reference to slavery. Right. I think the historic nature of the place and, and our notion of, of historical charm actually complicates it more because you have all these people who identify themselves as a pre preservationist when, when really what they are preserving are, are structures that, that are so imbued with white supremacy that they're unwilling to tangle with. So even, even though we celebrate Lee coming down, Andrew Jackson's monument still stands in the middle of the French Quarter. And Andrew Jackson was known as an Indian hunter in his time. He became president because he was so effective at killing Native Americans. He's the author of the Trail of Tears. But when you ask folks about like, ooh, now let's remove Andrew Jackson, people have a different sense of, oh, but that's real history. That's our history because of the Battle of New Orleans. So I think there's complications there that, you know, as Darcy's saying, aren't necessarily obvious when you're just like, pedestals, we did it. Well, I got to say, so my my second favorite person to appear in this film is the brother towards the end, who's like, take every name off. <laughs> and you're like, 200 names? You're like, yep, 200 names. I, I figured by the time he got done naming names, they'd be taking the Ford name off of the, of mm -hmm. the car dealerships. Yes. yes. <laughs> That's you know, he was a white supremacist too. Get rid of that Ford too, you know. Shout out to, uh, shout out to Malcolm Suber with Take Him Down Nola. Yes, he is so uncompromising in that scene. And that scene is like a checklist, right? Anyone watching this film can go Google how many of those names have come down since we filmed that scene. You just, it's, 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 it's literally a to-do list for New Orleans. But there's also something that the scene used to be funnier, right? Like going back to the comedy thing, the before 2020, when you see that list, people in rough cuts would laugh at how long that list is because it just shows how screwed we are, how much work we have to do. But then so many monuments start coming down in 2020 that that scene becomes less funny because it becomes more able for you to be able to picture these monuments coming down. Take them down, Nola, from the beginning, we would ask, you know, where should these monuments go? And they'd be like the bottom of the Mississippi River. And for a while, we had a piece of that in because we were like, that's that's true, but that's also funny. But that joke doesn't work anymore because we've thrown so many monuments in rivers. <laughs> it's nice. You know, and, and we'll have to talk to Greenpeace about that. <laughs> yes. There may be a whole nother documentary about the X. They might be biodegradable. You don't know, Eric. You know, <laughs> we can use it to protect the Louisiana yes. coastline. We can put those guys to work oh, out there. We're that's talking reef. artificial reefs. Okay. <laughs> Jefferson Davis makes an incredible artificial reef. Confederate reefs. <laughs> Confederate reefs. And they're wow. allowed to hear No I mean, black coral allowed. No <laughs> black coral allowed. <laughs> wow. Eric, this uh, is all of our IP, okay? These are the these are the new movies. We're gonna DM. Make IP no belongs black coral to allowed. us. DM. I got you. I got you. I don't, I, hey, I don't want to see if, you, I, if I, you release if you release that Confederate Reefs documentary next year, <laughs> Eric, we will have words. <laughs> So, um, but but I did want to talk about the moment when you wind up at Charlottesville, because uh, when I was watching the film, I, I thought to myself, you know, wow, this is kind of amazing. And I didn't know um, whether you knew when you went to Charlottesville, how important or crucial that was going to be. Um, so I wanted to ask you about that. I mean, I know you talked to the crazy black lady and the Confederate stuff who said something crazy was going to happen, but uh, Sunday. You know, yeah. Oh, you don't know about Sunday? <laughs> but uh, before you even got there, uh, did, did you know uh, or, or have an inkling of what was going to happen? Or did it just take you by surprise, like how crucial that footage became? I think you're making a joke about the, the Miss Arlene, the Black neo-Confederate who tells me to get out of town because no, you shouldn't be here Sunday. That Sunday was in Charlottesville. That Sunday was months before Charlottesville. And what you actually see is all those Oath Keepers and people in goggles and helmets coming out 
to the base of Lee Monument. Mm -hmm. And I think what I want to hold up is that part of that scene is comedy, right? We just showed it to a group of, of young black girls and they were laughing behind me going, look at how sad and dusty that is. <laughs> when, when you see the scene of just, you know, like the second line moving to take down the monument is full of power and full of life. And then you see these white supremacists just, just getting ready for their interaction. And it's so sad and dusty and pathetic. And that's the point of that scene, right? But many of those same people were also at Charlottesville. Mm. So it, it's this dichotomy of, of the humor and the horror. We are laughing at how pathetic they are. And then minutes later, we are seeing what it looks like with a couple months more preparation, what they are able to do in our world. Yep. Um, and we went trying to follow some of those folks, right? Aziz in the film is like, hey, the flaggers, the guys who are waving flags, some of those live streamers, he was following them to Charlottesville. And for me, I was like, this will make, you know, we thought the movie was over because the monuments that we'd been waiting 511 days for, those had finally come down. And so for me, I was like, this will be the last, this will be a last little bit, maybe like a post-credit sequence or just a nod to be like, you know, the struggle continues. We knew that there would be white supremacists there. We did not know that it would become one of the defining moments. And I think Darcy can speak more to this of like, that was the biggest challenge of like, you know, every time we think this film is over, White supremacy is like, aha, I have a new third act for you. I have a new whole sequence. Yes. We don't even, we don't have the capital riots in this film. Right. Right. right? right. We don't well. even, we don't even have Ahmaud Arbery's name in the film. So, so that the ability of white supremacy to surprise and to reinvent and to make new third acts was, was, was the biggest sort of technical challenge in being like, okay. For, for a long time, people looked at cuts where Charlottesville was the end and they were like, I can't even, we can't even see anything after Charlottesville. How is this the end of the movie? So that, that messed us up for a while being like, what do we even have to say about the country if we can't follow this, this glorious takedown with Charlottesville? Right, right. Darcy, that was, that was uh, Charlottesville is one of the few of the scenes that made it in the final film that everybody loves that I tried to cancel and ruin because I was like, there's no way production insurance is covering that. <laughs> <laughs> They're not, I don't know even how to write this down on a claim. CJ's in a field with neo-Confederates. Um, true producer. That's <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I mean, I, there was a lot of anxiety. We were in the edit for a long time for all the reasons we've talked about, you know, it was an issue of tone it was an issue of when is the story finished um and when we when we went out again per roy's instruction and our own impulse around um the protests after the murder of george floyd again it was really troubling we also had all these issues of like who do you send out to these protests um in the middle of a pandemic to cover uh, the public airing of trauma, right? And who's supposed to film that? And is that for us to film? And it, it felt um, just like Charlottesville feels like the, the much darker um, analog to, to the protests in New Orleans, the, the protests in 2020 felt darker and scarier and sadder. And how does this end us, right? I think we really, however, felt like what we got, and especially that day in June in New Orleans, in Jackson Square, was a moment of people refusing to give in, in spite of all of this. Um, and I think that was that was where we needed to end the film. Um, yes, we every single crew member on this film was glued to, like most of America, to our computers on January 6th, wondering if we should just pump the brakes one more time. But I think to CJ's point, it's never going to stop. Um, we have to stop the story at some point and we have to move ourselves uh, into another arc of storytelling. We have to be confident that we've made the points we need to make. And, um, and, and, and so, and we did, and I think what ended up happening is that we were able to release the film last year on Juneteenth, um, a year after um, June 2020 and uh, or this this year on Juneteenth um, and um, and I think for us that was really a moment where it felt like it, we had we had picked the right time to finish the work and get the film out in the world.
we also want you feeling, we want you feeling powerful and we want you feeling haunted. You know, it was, it was like, we, we can't end the film by being like, yay, we did it. And we can't end the film by being like, we're effed. But the idea of what you're watching in 2020 back to back is police beating people in the streets and protecting monuments, right? People are like, please, people over property. And they're like, step back from the property, right? Like the idea that, that the last montage is seeing all of this police violence, but you are also seeing people like taking the power to bring down structures themselves. We had more monuments come down in 2020 than we had for the five years since the Charleston massacre. Right, so we want folks leaving the film feeling like, damn, I feel powerful, but also understanding that white supremacy is on the ascendancy and the army in the streets is not neo-Confederates. It is folks who think that they can take black lives without any consequences. Eric, I wanted a nine hour documentary. CJ did not deliver that. So <laughs> we will be releasing parts three, four, five, six, and seven, more oh, yeah. neutral, Neutraler. The, neutral, the neutralist. Like from the drug of your car, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> two neutral, two like ground. <laughs> yes. He wants you, want you to be the black can burns. Is what he wants. Oh, yeah. I mean, Click the link under this window right now. <laughs> more neutral. <laughs> Why well, I don't I'm not I'm not mad at the I'm not mad at the black uh, the Blasian Ken Burns I'm I'm all about you know fast zooms <laughs> <laughs> I'm changing the game baby forget about slow zooms it's about fast zooms on archive about the dings the dings that's right <laughs> I still keep thinking about Roy's joke about the civil rights movies where the everything's in slow motion <laughs> yeah. It's not a good civil rights movie just something happens in slow motion. That's <laughs> right. you know, it's Eric, can I say a why Roy's Roy is joking about these sequels. I think he is, but you know, we may we got the footage. Um, but I but I do recommend if people go back and listen to Roy's first two albums, uh not first two, if they listen to um Father, Father Figure. Figure. Yeah. And then what was the one right after that, Roy? Uh that was No One Loves You. Yeah, if you listen to Father Figure and No One Loves You, it makes a wild paired reading for this film. You, wow. Like like you go back, his, his first joke on Father Figure is, but if they take down the Confederate flag, he's talking about what it is to work at a black museum. He's talking about mm -hmm. what it is for all of us to recognize that there's a problem with policing. So just, uh, just imagine being a new hire at The Daily Show and listening to those albums and being like, so so when can I when can I show him the film like <laughs> perfect the things he has been like talking about and saying it is a fun it is a very it's a fun wine pairing for this film that's wonderful um we only have a few minutes left and and uh I apologize because I'm probably going to drop a question on you that's pretty um big but um but first, first, I want to say, I hope you found a way to feel black without chasing white supremacists around because <laughs> I don't I don't want you to hurt yourself. Can you send me? Can you put that on a card? Can you put that on a card? <laughs> can that be a card you send me on Valentine's Day? I, I, I did most, black. most definitely. I but, hope you found a way to feel black without chasing white supremacists. Around. Exactly. Yeah, but but there's there's a. Um, it's been, we're in an interesting moment where we have a bunch of TV shows and things coming forth that's about people choosing to be black. I I, I feel you know Colin in black and white. I don't know if you watched that, but um, but you might want to check it out given that conversation that you had with your dad because Colin Kaepernick was a multiracial kid adopted by white parents from Wisconsin, and and when he was in middle school and high school, he decided that he was black and he started reaching towards blackness, and nobody in his world really understood it and that's a big part of the miniseries it's really interesting and i feel like this is us you know the steve uh sterling k brown's character yeah, this is, us, is another black man who's 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 choosing to be black and, and and i think we had a president frankly who who chose to be black at some point in his life you know mm -hmm. he embraced his blackness uh, in a way that he didn't have to and 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 so i wonder you know it sounds like you went through that same kind of journey and i wonder if you feel like we're in a moment where people who can in a way choose to be black um where their stories are becoming more visible and and we're talking about them more and we're interrogating them more absolutely i absolutely feel that i mean you know uh, one of the one of the first very hard conversations about this film was stanley nelson pulling me aside at my first firelight 
retreat and saying, look, you need to go hard on this film. Like you need to dig deeper than a couple of jokes on an iPad. And he said, if you need to find a way to be black to finish this film, you need to go do that. Mm. And so for me, for me, I, I love the paradigm that you're talking about, about stories about reaching towards blackness and choosing your blackness. I think for me, it is slightly more complicated in it's not that I was not identifying as black. It is that my blackness is rooted in confrontation and rooted in only being able to see myself in a reflection bouncing off of white supremacy. So I need to run towards white supremacy in order to get that bounce back and be like, yeah, that's how black I am. You know, like I am, I am constantly in battle and I define myself through this battle with white supremacy. So for me, it's two things. It's one, being able to do exactly what you're saying about like, dang, I, I need a way to be able to see myself without chasing these people around. But then also I think this, th those scenes with my dad about talking about finding that blackness and not understanding it when I was young. I now see that scene again and again as we watch it with teenagers. And I see it give them space. I see them talk about it in the Q and A's. And I think it is giving folks space to reflect on the different types of ways they feel black or, 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 or you know, the multitude of ways of being black and, and what it is to struggle with that. So I, I definitely feel that these types of stories are giving folks more space. That's awesome. And now we have your father to tell us what he thinks. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> would be like, boy, that's not what you said. You said <laughs> that would have been cool, though. <laughs> Do a live yeah, action version like, of that scene. <laughs> you're like, Eric, you're friends with my dad? <laughs> yeah, why is my what? dad at your house? <laughs> dad, why are you not picking up my text? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you guys so much for joining us in this panel. We have uh, run out of time. We're probably way past time, but I, I, I just love talking to you guys about this film. It's it's such a, a great piece of work and I hope a lot of people get to see it. Uh, we're talking about The Neutral Ground, which aired on PBS as a PO, uh, in uh, POV. Where else can people see this uh, this film? I, I caught up with it on PBS's Passport uh, service, but um, uh, where else can people see it? We're live right now through December 1st on uh, pbs.org and then we will be launching on uh, VOD and international uh, distribution starting Jan 1. So um, if you can, can't catch it on PBS this month, then uh, you'll be able to see it on Jan 1. And on Jan 1, all you have to do is type in on Google the Neutral Ground documentary and you should be able to find it. Awesome. Well, many thanks to producer Darcy McKinnon. Uh, to uh, executive producer Roy Wood Jr. and narrator, writer, director, chief bottle washer, bottle washer, uh, professional <laughs> black man, CJ <laughs> Hunt. Uh, guys, thank you so much for joining us. Thank we you, really Eric. Appreciate it. And thanks to the International Documentary Association for making this panel possible. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, IDA. Thank you so much.